Good evening. Good visiting going on. I hate to break that up, but uh, I believe it is time to begin our service. <clears throat> we'll uh, begin with uh, a couple of songs, and then I think Donnie's got our opening prayer. And uh, all right. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide, the darkness deepens, Lord with me abide. Help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. Swift to its close, ebbs out life's little day. Earth's joys grow dim. away change and decay in all around I see oh thou who changest not abide with me Sunshine, oh, abide with me. Hold thou thy cross before my closing eyes. Shine through the gloom and point me. shadows flee in life in death oh Lord abide with me I need the every hour most gracious Lord no tender voice like thine can peace afford I need thee oh I need thee hour I need thee, O oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. I need thee every hour, stay thou near by. 
temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. I will be led in an opening prayer. Bow with me, please. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, it is so good to be here tonight. We thank you Father, for the beautiful day that we've had today. We thank you for the beautiful lessons that was brought to us. We thank you for the preaching of the Word. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that each of us are seeking lost souls and trying to commit people to come to you. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would be there for us every hour of every day. We need you every hour. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will help us to be led into all righteousness through your word, your, through your commands and decrees that you have given us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word. We pray that we will all seek you in truth and in wisdom. We pray, Heavenly Father, <clears throat> that you will be with those that are among us that are sick, friends and relatives and those that are in need of our prayers. And we ask, Heavenly Father, if it be your will to bring them back to a wanted and needed state of health and strength. We pray, Heavenly Father, that each of us would live personal lives that employ or put you at the head of everything, Heavenly Father. Help us, Heavenly Father, to seek the kingdom of heaven and to one day live with you in paradise in heaven. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for that goal that should rest heavily upon our minds and for us to guide our lives in that direction. We thank you 
for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We thank you for the mercy and the grace. Help us, Heavenly Father, to increase in faith. Help us, Heavenly Father, to seek that heavenly home. Thank you, Father, for this evening. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will be with Brother Jerry. Help us to take to heart all that he teaches. And help us, Heavenly Father, to resolve to remember. Go with us now as we sing another hymn and as we do the things that we're scheduled to do and honor you in prayer and in song and in thought with all our being. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. reading it in the, e in the morning that I forgot to say good evening. Today we will be reading from Luke chapter 4 verses 33 through 37. And it reads, And there was a man in the synagogue possessed by the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What, what, to, what do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? 
I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him without doing any harm. And amazement came upon them all, and they began discussing with one another, saying, What is this message? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him was getting out into every locality in the surrounding district. Thank you, Harrison, and good evening, church. I forgot to turn my phone off, and as sure as I don't, somebody will call me right in the middle of this sermon. Don't normally forget that, but I did. It was 1974 in April. I had just turned 20 years old on the 16th of that month. This was in the 20s, 20th, maybe 24th, something like that. There was an outbreak of tornadoes in our community. And uh, many people were lost their things and Jean and I lived in a little house on Spring Street in Mount Sterling, and she was pregnant with Miranda. Miranda was born in July that year, so you know how big she was in April. She had May, June, and July to go. So she, uh, we were young, and the electric went off, and I was on the last chapter of The Exorcist. I was reading The Exorcist when the tornado came. And I couldn't wait to see what happened. And so with my young, frightened, pregnant wife trembling in the bedroom, I went to the living room and finished reading The Exorcist by candlelight. And I still remember that. I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I had been more sensitive to my wife. But I tell you all that to tell you this. Americans have been fascinated with demon possession for a long time. And it is a Bible subject. It is a real Bible subject. I told you this morning that uh, Hazel Joel put it in the question box. By the way, we have a question box in the back, and anything you want Dan and me to deal with, uh, put it in there or come and tell us. And we don't mind. If it's a Bible subject, we'll deal with it. We're not afraid of any Bible subject. This one was a tough one. I had to do a lot of reading on this one. It had been a long time since I spoke about it. But it is a fascination with our culture now, more so perhaps than any other time. And uh, there's just a lot of fascination with dead people and zombies and dark things. And I see it all over the place. Cynthia has become kind of a headquarters for walking dead people and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, you do need to know. We do need to know, and I appreciate Hazel for doing this. Uh, We need to know the truth about these things. And we need to know where the Bible stands, because that's the truth, and that's where uh, we're going to go with these things. In preparing for this lesson, I read read several things written by our brethren, one by J. Noel Meredith, very excellent treatise on demon possession, another by Brother Wendell Gann, another by Brother Arthur Pigman, and, uh, and then a, third, a fourth by Brother Edwin Jones. And uh, I read some other things, but these brethren, I gleaned more from them than perhaps any of the others. And so the Bible does present demons as being real. Where did they originate? What was their purpose? Uh, do they possess people today against their will? They obviously did possess people in the first century against their will. The growth of uh, this kind of thing has uh, its become more and more interesting to some people. They represent the dark side, the opposite of good, and uh, I think that's why people are obsessed with knowing about them because uh, uh, it's a side that uh, Christians uh, have uh, traditionally and, and probably wisely kind of stayed away from. And uh, I remember one time I was given an assignment to... Uh, lecture on the occult, and I was assigned five books to read by, not by brethren, by people from the occult and from the dark side, if you will. 
And as I read those books, and I almost finished the fifth one, and Jean, uh, we were driving along one day, and she said, what's happened to you? And I said, what are you talking about? And, and unbeknownst to me, I, ha I didn't really realize it, but the more I read of those things, the darker I became, and the darker thoughts I be my thought the darker my thoughts became, and the more uh, the the uh, more pessimistic, and uh, I just call it darkness, uh, kind of came over me. And so uh, it is a real thing. Some early beliefs relative to demons continue till this present day. Some view demons as uh, the personification of evil. Now there's an interesting, I've quoted this many times in my 40 plus year preaching career, Matthew 12, 43 through 45. I memorized it in preaching school and the reason I normally use it, uh, I use this scripture to teach that if you drive the evil out of your life, you need to fill it back up with something good or you'll be more evil. But it also teaches us, and this is Jesus talking here, it teaches us a great deal about demons in the first century, doesn't it? First of all, Jesus is talking to the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, they weren't literally demon-possessed, but they behaved as if they were, and that's why he told them that. They attributed his powers and his miracles to demons and uh, to uh, the prince of demons, Beelzebub. And uh, so he answers that accusation with this. He says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, lesson number one, unclean spirits lived in men and they could come and go as they pleased, apparently. They could go out. He goes through dry places seeking rest. It seems that demons like to dwell in desolate places. We read of them being in the mountains, Mark 5 and verse 2, Luke 11 and verse 24, among the tombs, the, the guy that they called uh, a legion in Mark 5 dwelt in the graveyard among the tombs, and uh, then here in dry or waterless places. Now I'll, I'll throw out a theory here in a minute that uh, in a little bit that some people have about from where demons came that it's almost comical. Gene and I were talking about it a while ago, uh, about this dry, waterless places thing. But so first of all, uh, demons can come and go, could come and go as they pleased. He could go out of a man, but they're always looking for a body. They're always looking for somebody. They don't like being uh, disembodied spirits. He goes through dry places, and what's he seeking? Rest, peace, a body in which to live. And he finds none. So what does he do? He goes and takes with him seven other more wicked spirits than he is. And they enter and dwell. And of course, the man that had one demon now has eight. And he's worse. Uh, the last state of that man is worse than the first. And then Jesus, uh, attributing this to the scribes and the Pharisees in Matthew 12, the last thing he said that I don't have on the screen is, so also shall it be with this wicked generation. You keep doing the things you're doing, you'll be as wicked as a man who had eight unclean spirits in him. So, uh, in the New Testament, uh, there are 108 references to demons in the New Testament. Uh, people were possessed with demons. Uh, one was called demonical, unclean spirits, as we just read in Matthew 12. Uh, 21 times, evil spirits six times, uh, and Paul dealt with a young girl who was possessed with a demon that gave her the ability to uh, practice divination, which is foretelling of the future and those kinds of things. And then Luke 13, 11, one had a spirit of infirmity, and as I said, it's a Bible subject, folks, because it's mentioned 108 times in the New Testament alone. What were demons? And this, we'll spend a little bit of time on this because there's, uh, there's a lot of speculation about what these actually were. Uh, some say is a myth or a superstition. Well, we can dismiss that one because the Bible says they were real. Uh, that denies what the Bible teaches. And so we know it's, uh, one writer said that I read said, it's a myth, a superstition, and Jesus just played to their superstitions to get them to listen to him and show how powerful enough uh, he was, how powerful he was. Uh, there are some who take Genesis chapter 6 and say that angels, sons of God, 
had sexual relations with uh, earthly women, and they had their offspring were these uh, evil spirits. Well, Jesus said plainly in Matthew 22 and verse 30, angels don't marry, nor are they given in marriage. So that shoots that theory. Uh, they, uh, angels, angelic beings, created beings, uh, whether they be good or bad, did not have children with human women. Uh, the, probably the most popular idea is fallen angels. Uh, and there is, a, there is such a category as angels, Peter said, who did not keep their proper dominion but rebelled. And a lot of people think that's who these unclean spirits are. I struggle with that belief because of this. I'll tell you why I don't think that's the case. Angels didn't have to possess anybody, and we have no record of angels possessing other bodies. Angels could, de could transform themselves into looking like human beings. They didn't have to get inside of human beings. They could make themselves look like human beings. And uh, when it was necessary to do so, and I'll tell you something uh, in the way of proof of that is Genesis 18, and 19, Abraham looked and saw three men coming toward him. Well, it turned out one of them was one called the Lord, and the other two were angels on their way to deliver Lot and his family out of Sodom. And so uh, Abraham thought they were men, but then he didn't say anything about them embodying uh, or possessing uh, the bodies of other men, what they were doing. They disguised themselves, or they were able to look like transform, I like, they were able to transform themselves into looking like men. They weren't men, but they looked like men. Then there's this bizarre theory that uh, there was a race of people before Adam and Eve was created, and uh, they, uh, were, they all died, and then God had to start over again with the void earth and everything that we read about in Genesis chapter 1. And these are the spirits of those. You can dismiss that because the Bible over and over again says Adam was the first man. So what that leaves us with is a theory that I believe has some merit. I will not say absolutely this is the way it is, but many scholars, especially those in our brotherhood, believe that they are uh, the spirits of uh, departed, particularly uh, wicked men who somehow were allowed to come out of Tartarus, a uh, torment in the Hadean realm for a time uh, when Jesus and the apostles were on earth to drive them out, to show the power of Jesus. Now, uh, J. Noel Meredith takes this position. He says, demons are the departed spirit of what must have been especially wicked men which in some way were temporarily allowed out of Tartarus and possessed people in Bible times. Uh, I mean, we're talking about some pretty bizarre things here, but that makes as much sense to me as anything. Uh, that uh, these uh, wicked men, in order to show Jesus' power over them, uh, their spirits were allowed to wander the earth and uh, find bodies to inhabit. Uh, you know uh, from Luke chapter 16, many folks believe a depiction of the afterlife uh, awaiting the final judgment, and uh, that is that all righteous people who have ever lived and died, are their spirits are in a place called paradise. And you remember the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16, 19 through 31. Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom, or paradise, and uh, the rich man who had never given him even a crumb from his table and had lived sumptuously on earth was in torment uh, in Tartarus. And so uh, it is thought by some that uh, the evil spirits come from that place. Um, and here's an interesting thing about what Jesus was able to do to them. Uh, when evening had come, they brought to him many possessed with demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick, Matthew 8 and verse 16. So if indeed, wh whatever these demons were, we know that they were evil, and we know that they possessed people against their will, and we know that Jesus had power over them. We know those three things. Those are three things that we can know. Jesus had power over them, and he also gave the apostles power over them. 
So some of the people possessed uh, with demons, uh, the old King James sadly translates it devils, and it's not the same thing as Satan. Satan's a whole different category. He is a, a different being uh, than these. But uh, sometimes the King James translates what should have been demons uh, to devils. Uh, in Matthew 9 and verse 32 and following, uh, they, it rendered a man, uh, uh, a man was uh, uh, demon-possessed and uh, the, the New King James says mute or unable to speak. And uh, the thought, the reason he couldn't was this demon. This demon had rendered him unable to speak. Uh, in Matthew 12 and verse 22, that one was blind and mute. He, was, he couldn't see and he was unable to speak until the demon was driven out. Then he was healthy, he was normal, so it was the demon doing that. Luke 8 and 26 and following uh, talks about uh, uh, one that was insane or they called the old King James, I think, calls him a lunatic. And uh, I think that's, uh, never, that's where we got our word lunacy from. Uh, anyway, but... Um, he was, it would drive some, or cause someone to behave insanely. Uh, personal injuries, my son throws himself in the fire and he hurts himself and all of those, nobody in their right mind would do that, but he was uh, demon possessed and did that. Other physical defects, uh, Luke 13 and verse 11, supernatural strength, the man that was called uh, 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 Legion and uh, he also appeared insane, but uh, he would break the bonds in uh, Luke 8 and also Mark 5. Uh, he would, uh, when they would chain him, he had the ability to break those things. Uh, they were savage, some of them. Matthew 8 and 28, uh, so fierce that no one would pass that way, pass these people that were possessed by demons. And uh, superhuman strength and all those things were uh, part of uh, the symptoms of demon possession in De Jesus' day. They possessed everybody. They possessed men, women, daughters, sons. People came to Jesus and would say things like, my son is demon possessed, my daughter is severely uh, demon possessed and causes these things. And Jesus in the limited commission in Matthew 10 and also in the Great Commission in Mark 16, uh, went on to tell or to show the uh, disciples, the apostles, give them the ability to do that. And they were, uh, Mark 16 and 17 says, they were substantiating their claims that uh, the gospel was true by the signs they did. And one of those signs was the ability to drive demons out. Peter, Philip, and Paul all were given the ability uh, to drive out or cast out demons. And uh, there are, of course, in Acts 19, there are seven sons of Sceva thought they could take uh, the power from Paul and Jesus and drive out demons. And it shows you the personality of those, uh, some of those demons. They were real personalities, real spirits, because uh, they uh, responded to those uh, fake uh, people who were trying to drive them out, and they said, uh, Paul, we know, and Jesus, we know, but we don't know you. And they, uh, the man in whom the demons possessed uh, uh, was uh, causing physical harm to those sons who were trying to drive the demons out without God's authority. In the first century, Jesus had control over both the physical and the spiritual. We have examples of the physical. He calmed the sea when uh, the disciples were, the apostles were afraid of the uh, wind and the waves. Uh, with a word, he calmed the sea. He healed people of all manner of things. Uh, a woman was bent over for years and he straightened her up. Another woman had been hemorrhaging for 12 years and she touched the hem of his garment and it was healed. Uh, blind people were healed and all of that uh, to show that he had the power over the physical. Changed water to wine, one of the first, the, the first miracle that he did in John chapter 2. Uh, also, uh, he had, and he raised Lazarus from the death, uh, John 11. 
uh, from death and from the grave after four days, which was, uh, we talked about that Wednesday night in uh, John chapter 12. That caused all kind of commotion because here was this man who was dead for four days and had already been wrapped in the burial clothes and prepared with the spices and all that. And he walked out and now here he was sitting at the table eating with people in John 12 and verse 2. And so uh, people that didn't believe were having a problem with him. Uh, and so Jesus had power over all that. He also had power over the spiritual realm in that he cast out demons. And I like what Paul said about him in Colossians 2 and verse 15. He disarmed principalities and powers and he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. Of course, he was able to do that. Now, in thinking about who they were and the nature of them and that kind of thing. I want to read a quote from Brother Edwin Jones. Brother Jones said, They seem to want a body, any body, even a pig body. Mark chapter 12, or 5, Mark chapter 5. Having flesh in which to abide seemed very important to them. This seems to me to better fit something uh, that at one uh, that at one time had a body rather than an evil angel who never had a body or as an angel could manifest different outward appearances. And so the nature of them is they seem to want a body uh, no matter what. Uh, there are characteristics of demons uh, found in the New Testament. Uh, they could go out and uh, go, go in and out of people at will, as I mentioned earlier. They uh, possessed knowledge and they recognized Jesus as the Son of God and uh, knew their ultimate destiny. They knew they were going to eventually be uh, entrapped again and not ever able to do this again. Uh, they, uh, as we said earlier, like to dwell in desolate places. And so the big question, there's a little bit about demons and there's a lot more, but uh, is it possible for them to inhabit our bodies against our will and make us do evil things. Now, the world wants to believe that, family. They do, and here's why. Because if I do a horribly evil thing, and I don't think I'm a horribly evil person, what's the explanation? I was possessed. A demon made me do it. And so it gets me off the hook. I'm not responsible for my own actions. Have you noticed that Americans don't like to be responsible for their actions? Have you noticed that it's fun, that it, it's good for us uh, in our culture? It's considered a good thing to find somebody else to blame? I always think of my lawyer friend who said, I'm getting tired of people coming in and saying, I'm looking for somebody to sue. <laughs> you know, I, somebody, this is bound to be somebody else's fault. And so is the case with demon possession uh, is it possible today? It, if it is, then Satan has uh, risen again and has been given more power than he's had uh, for this whole 2,000 years. And I don't believe that's the case. One of the things that I didn't mention, the Bible in several places talks about an age when Satan's power was unleashed and an age when it was limited, severely limited. You remember that Job... Uh, he had to ask permission to inflict Job. And he had to ask permission for Peter to sift him like wheat. And he could not do anything without the Father allowing him to. And the Revelation letter, of verse tw uh, chapter 20, talks about, or the Revelation, not a letter, but uh, talks about him being limited in the Christian age in the thousand years. And he's limited to the point that he can't possess you against your will. Uh, God would not leave us helpless. And we another factor to consider is the miraculous driving out demons and being possessed by them and all of that. According to 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 8 and following, Paul said, when that which is perfect has come, perfect has come, that which is uh, uh, miraculous will be done away with. Miracles will cease. Uh, prophecies will cease, including demon possession, because it takes a miracle 
and someone with great power to drive them out. And so if they have ceased, and I believe they have, I think you can take your Bible and prove they have, that we don't have miracles such as we had when Jesus was walking on earth and when the apostles were walking on earth. If that's the case, it would seem that uh, God would not, uh, it's reasonable to believe that with the passing of the apostles and their power, the last people upon whom they laid hands when they had died, uh, their, and the age of demon possession passed away also. So here's my conclusion in my, of this premise, uh, this question, and it's a good question. Uh, what was demon possession and does it happen today? I do not believe that demons have the power to bodily possess people today as they did in Jesus' day. Don't believe that. But, on the other hand, I do believe the devil exerts great influence in our world. Uh, even though his chain is shortened and he's not allowed to pull people out of Tartarus and turn them loose on the world, uh, he influences through many ways. Deceit, lust, lies. Uh, I, I should have probably capitalized lusts because that seems to be one of things that we desire or things that uh, humans uh, would make their bodies feel good and those kinds of things seems to be one of his greatest tools. He can only enter if we allow him to. He can take, and even not the way they did, not as demon possession, but he can take over our lives. John 10, 28 and 29 talks about, uh, Jesus talking about, his father and the relationship of Jesus and his sheep. He says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand and I and my father are one. Satan cannot control your life or exert influence on you unless you allow him to. Now these poor people in the first century apparently didn't have a choice. Uh, those demons uh, would possess them because they didn't want them in there and they would seek out Jesus and the apostles to have them driven out. Uh, but you, you have a choice. You are in control of yourself. You decide whether or not you want to uh, live for Satan. So what is demon possession? Can demons possess us today against our will? Demons possess people in Bible times as a means to show the power of Jesus and the apostles to drive them out. It would not be consistent with the God that we know, the God of love, who is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance uh, for him to allow them to possess us today. And so what does that do, preacher? Well, that uh, puts the ball in our court. That makes it up to us whether or not we want to live for Satan, whether or not we want to have our uh, sins taken away by the blood of Jesus and live for him, or do we want to continue to behave as the wicked, lost, and dying world. And so I hope I've answered this question. I hope I have, if you're not a child of God, given you incentive to come out of the lost and dying world and be cleansed by the blood of Jesus and help us, uh, let us help you to come into the fold and then you help us to bring others to Christ. If you're subject to the invitation, come right now as we stand and sing. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no and obey not a 
The Lord's Supper remains prepared this evening for those that may not have had the opportunity to partake earlier today. Be reading a passage of scripture to you from Luke chapter 22 this evening, beginning in verse 44. When the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. When he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. We certainly want to be mindful that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper so that we might be reminded of the sacrifice that he has made for us. So we want to make that available to you this evening. Kenan, would you ask the blessing on the bread this evening? Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful day that you bless us with. Father, we thank you for the body that Jesus, that he gave willingly on the cross. And Father, we just, we pray as we partake of this emblem, the bread that represents his body, we pray that we do so in a manner that's pleasing to you. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with us as we continue around the table this evening. As we have members that are observing the Lord's Supper, Father, allow our minds to be able to go back to the cross and to envision so that it, it remains real with us the price that was paid, the shedding of the blood of Jesus. Father, we are hurt when we consider what was done on our behalf. Father, we know that Jesus was perfect. He had done no wrong. But he was still willing to go and pay the price so that we might be redeemed. And Father, we just pray that you be with each one as they partake here this evening of the emblem which represents this blood. Help us to always focus our minds and to realize the depth of your love for us. This is my prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. A separate part of our worship is taking up an offering. As we were told to lay aside on the first day of the week. We're looking at Matthew chapter 6 this evening, the scripture beginning in verse 19. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching here, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where, moth, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We're certainly a very blessed people, a blessed country, a blessed congregation. And we always need to be mindful of where those blessings all come from. And the scriptures are very plain in telling us that it is God that is behind those things. Would you bow with me at this time? Heavenly Father, we come before you with gratitude. Father, we realize that you have given so much to us. Father, we can spend time making a list of the things which you give us, and it would go on and on. For Father, we realize that you're the giver of life, you're the giver of the necessities, you're the giver of hope, you're the giver of eternal life because of Jesus. And Father, as you have blessed us so richly, help us to have the spirit of generosity that we have a desire to want to give back to be able to give in such a mean that the, the scriptures can be shared and the gospel may be taught so that those that are outside of your kingdom will have opportunity. And Father, we also realize that there are physical needs from time to time, that those among our uh, congregation as well as our neighborhoods here have physical needs and, and we have the opportunity to be able to help them. Uh, Father, just allow us to do these things and if uh, they bring about glory may it always bring glory to your name and not ours this is my prayer in Christ's name amen if you desire to give this evening I will have a tray available in the back of the auditorium and you can deposit that as you as you leave Jerry, you can relax now. You, you've got that accomplished. <laughs> we appreciate uh, appreciate the the lesson tonight, and and appreciate our young people uh, bringing questions like that that's on their minds. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, just a few things uh, to remind us of. Uh, I want to remember that the church family game night is, is Friday at 6 p.m. We're going to move it to the fellowship hall because they're set up for the day. Okay, okay. The, the game night will be over here in the fellowship hall because they'll be set, setting up for uh, the dinner of thanks on, on Saturday. So. And remember, Saturday is, is the dinner of thanks, and it's at 6 uh, p.m. over here. So, 
uh, and then commit uh, youth rally at Richmond Church of Christ will be the 10th through the 12th and there will be a van going uh, Friday through Saturday yes Mike The van, okay. Okay, be here. Uh, the kids need to be here at 5.30 uh, to go to the uh, commit on Friday. And then you'll tell them, I guess, the date, the times for the rest of the time. So, uh, do have a couple of new announcements. Uh, Clint uh, Benson wants to thank uh, everyone for the cards and, and the prayers. And uh, uh, he says to let you know he reads every one of them, and and that's that's great that, that he does, and 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 he he appreciates that. He has a neurologist appointment uh, follow up on Tuesday, so uh, would appreciate prayers for a good uh, visit on on Tuesday. Also, uh, uh, Pam again is called this afternoon, and Jim will be having surgery. Jim McGinnis will have surgery on Friday, and uh, they're requesting prayers for Jim and, and the, the surgery that he has on Friday. Are there any other announcements before we close? Okay, let's have a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are again thankful for another day of life that you blessed us with. We're thankful for being able to come out and be with our brothers and sisters in Christ today. We're thankful for the edification that we receive through them. We're thankful that we were able to worship you and sing songs of praise and hear messages from you, from your word. We pray that you'll continue to go with us through this night, watch over us through this week, and bring us back at the next appointed time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.